what I wanted to do is to highlight just um, some of the kind of um, quirks of human thinking that I think are relevant to, um, to the problem, how we've got ourselves in this situation, um, and also the solution, how um, I think we need to think about how to get ourselves out of it. So um, I could go on and on. There are, there are many, you know, humans are very complex and there are many factors that influence our behavior, but there are a few that are pretty salient. So one of the, um, the problems that we have dealt with a lot in the last 30 or so years is simple denial of the problem. And um, this is something that we are slowly getting to grips with because we are seeing this kind of sea change in people's acceptance that there is a problem. And I think partly that's because we are now starting to be able to physically see the climate changing around us. So we tend not to really believe abstract things as much as we believe the evidence of our own eyes. And certainly for me, it was when I started to realize that the climate in the place where I live has changed noticeably in 20 years. I started to really realize that it was a problem, and then I started to read about it and so on. Um, denial is a psychological defense mechanism, and its function is presumably to allow us to um, push to one side very large existential threats that we can't do anything about so that we can concentrate on the daily kind of life activities that keep us alive and keep our children alive. So um, doctors see it a lot when people are given a diagnosis of cancer, for example. That's a huge existential threat. Um, and in order to be able to get up and go to work in the morning, people just kind of push it to one side, sometimes to the extent that they don't even acknowledge that they have it. So I think that the denial that we're seeing um, across society about this problem is partly this fear fear of loss, fear of what it would mean to believe that the climate is changing. Um, and I think there's also an element of malignant denial in, in some sectors of the population. So there are some uh, people for whom it's advantageous to not believe that there's a problem for, you know, maybe they have a job that's selling fossil fuels or something. So denial is something we, we really need to come to grips with. And the evidence suggests that we're not going to um, tackle it by just giving people information, because if they have already built a wall against information, more information is not going to help. So we need to sort of reach past that wall. And the way to do that is to gain um, people's trust um, and, to, um, and to not threaten them, essentially. So, so somehow to get them to accept that there's a problem without feeling that, the, that life is going to sort of crumble all around them. So we need to think about how we're going to do that um, to bring everybody on board with this. The second problem is that we have a bit of a scale problem. So even people who acknowledge that the climate is changing and that we need to do something about it sometimes don't really appreciate the scale of what's happening. So, and, and I admit to being one of these people. So for a long time... I was one of the people who said, well, okay, the climate's changing, I believe the scientists, and so on, but uh, technology will take care of it. They're building all of these amazing things that pull carbon dioxide out of the air, and scientists are amazing, engineers are amazing, and, and we will solve it, and we'll plant some trees. You know. So when I started to uh, get interested in the climate problem and actually look at the numbers, it beca slowly became apparent that the scale of this is um, nothing that... Um, I was able to really apprehend with my mind. So, for example, I had been thinking, well, why don't we plant trees? Um, a lot of people are saying, why don't we plant trees? We've got the Thousand Trees Initiative, the Million Trees Initiative, the Billion Trees Initiative, and then recently the Trillion Trees Initiative. So a lot of people are thinking we can plant trees. And it is true that trees take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and that does seem like that would be a wonderful solution. But when you actually look at the numbers, it turns out that um, we would have to plant an area of land um, around about six times the size of Africa um, in order to deal with emissions at the rate that we're currently producing them. And given that emissions are increasing exponentially and there's no sign of a decrease in that, that's only to deal with our current emissions. We would have to plant you know, e even more. Now, now that we just don't have that much um, empty real estate on the planet, and even if we did... Um, we would have significant problems trying to keep that many trees alive and prevent them from burning. So we can see that you know, carbon dioxide is a problem, trees take carbon dioxide out of the air, but what we fail to do is to match those, um, those things for scale. And I think this is a big problem um, in the industry as well. So we have all sorts of um, renewable energy industries and tree planting initiatives and this, that, and the other. Um, and everybody feels that they're doing their bit and that if everybody did their bit, then we would be fine. But when you look at the um, size of what needs to be done, then it's a really huge task. And we're not going to solve it by 
doing anything except decarbonizing, essentially. So, so we cannot sustain our fossil fuel economy, is the, is the sad uh, truth. Uh, another kind of quirk of human um, thinking is the tragedy of the commons problem, which I see is mentioned in the handout. So the tragedy of the commons refers to the propensity that people have to, um, to, to overweight personal gain at the expense of collective loss. And it takes its name from this very famous scenario that was outlined by Garrett Hardin in the 1960s where uh, villagers were trying to figure out how many animals they could put on the commons. And he showed that, logically, every villager's cost-benefit uh, way up comes out in favor of each villager putting more animals on the land. But, of course, the collective outcome is that the commons collapses under the weight of all the animals. So the climate crisis is a huge tragedy of the commons problem. Every economy, every, every country can see that it's in their own interest to keep doing their um, economic activities, which are fueled by fossil fuels. But, of course, the collective outcome of that is that we get climate change and the global economy will eventually collapse. So we need to deal with this problem. Now, the only way that humans in the past have dealt with the tragedy of the commons problem is to use their ability to collectively cooperate and to bargain with each other and say, look, you know, I won't put my animals on the common if you don't. Um, and let, let's all agree that we're not going to do it. So we have managed to overcome commons problems in the past. The question now is whether we can do this on a global scale. So that's the really big challenge. And then um, finally, um, we're quite vulnerable as a, as a complex society to uh, subversion by what I think of as viral forces. So um, forces that, that kind of form and exploit the existing structures that we have for their own gain. For example, corporations that get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger um, until they have a disproportionate amount of power. Fossil fuel industry, again, is probably a, a good example of that. Um, fascism, which is a kind of form of social organization which gets bigger and bigger and, and gets more and more control and so on. So we don't yet know how to structure society so that we are not vulnerable to um, viral takeover by these subversive forces. That's something that um, we need to think about somehow. Okay, so I just want to finish with some, uh, some optimistic things. So what, um, what kinds of things might we be able to do? So there are certain ways that humans think that we can exploit in trying to think of how to deal with this problem. One is that we are unusually attached to the future. So most animals can't even think about the future. They don't really have the capacity to, to kind of reason um, a, a long time the way that we do. Um, but we do, and we, because we have children and we care about our children and our grandchildren and so on and so on, we have this notion of protecting uh, the planet for future generations. So this is another one of those things where you're sacrificing your, um, your own benefit in the here and now for some far-off future goal. And it's actually quite characteristic of humans that they do care about the future and do worry about it. And so we can tap into that. And I think what we're seeing with these social movements that are welling up is uh, people are coming out and saying, we care about the future, we want there to be a future for uh, our children and our children's children and so on. The second thing is that humans are quite, we're, we're very social. And um, although we you know, prioritize our own welfare, we all also um, like to form social bonds with other people. We like to kind of bond together in families and tribes and, and groups of people. And we um, are able to use those social affiliations to uh, cooperate in relatively you know, small groups, nation states, for example. The question is, can we use social affiliation to cooperate globally? Like, can we um, generate a mindset in which the human race is our tribe and that we care as much about what's happening to the people on the other side of the world as we keep, care about the people in our own country? Now, we don't know whether we have the capacity to do that because we evolved in a world where our social groups were very small. Um, but on the other hand, we do have this amazing, um, you know, adaptability. And so I like to think that we have the capacity to form what you might think of as a global community or a, a global tribe. Um, and then finally, another um, tool that I think we should not um, be dismissive of is capitalism. So capitalism, I probably shouldn't say this as, a, as an Extinction Rebellion member, because <laughs> it tends to be a little bit anti-capitalist, but capitalism is a form of social organization in which we've managed to take the cost benefits as they pertain to individuals um, and enable us to trade in those. So using this abstract thing, money, um, I'm able to negotiate with somebody I've never met in some other country on the other side of the world and say, um, if I do this for you, um, will you do this for me? And the mediator of that is money. Um, and because of that, we've managed to get a fairly cooperative group of seven and a half billion of us 
Um, and yes, we have problems where you have wars and there's conflict and strife and so on, but it's actually remarkable how cooperative we are and how well our global economy actually runs. We've managed to really reduce levels of poverty. We've managed to solve a lot of problems of disease and so on. So capitalism, it exists. Um, we're not going to get rid of it um, in, in the near future. So I think we need to think of it as a tool and to think to tackle the climate crisis, we need to make it something that capitalism can use. So we need to make it economically advantageous for people to, to act in a pro-climate way. We need to reconfigure the economy so that uh, green activities become financially beneficial and destructive activities become financially harmful. So that's a huge task. I don't know how we're going to do it, but um, that's what we have to do if we're going to maintain our standard of living and, and kind of forge on into the future.